So this talk will be a little bit different from the other talks. You will see in what sense. So indeed, uh, we will talk about combinatorial designs in uh, quantum many-body physics. So I come from a different community. I come from um, well, community of quantum many-body physics, but in more particular, we are dealing with integrable and exactly solvable models. And you will see that we use now combinatorial designs for a specific purpose. I will explain what it is. So you know, combinatorial design theory is a part of mathematics, but even earlier, it, it made appearance in physics. For example, information theory or quantum information theory. This is very well known. Many people in the audience do something for quantum information theory. But in this talk, I will talk about something else, application to quantum many-body physics. And it just turns out that we will use certain combinatorial objects as building blocks for inter uh, interacting dynamics. In more particular, we will do it for one-dimensional cellular automata. So this means that the cellular automaton, which is defined in one space dimension. And in certain sense, you will see that uh, the combinatorial designs that we will have will play the role of the fundamental equation of motion for these systems. Um, what, uh, so to say the end result, we will see that we can obtain solvable cellular automata in some sense. I need to explain to you what, in what sense it is solvable. So let us start. So, okay, we, we will deal with uh, cellular automata, which can be classical or quantum. Uh, when, when you say cellular automaton, then of course you have the classical one in mind. I will explain what, what is a quantum cellular automaton. Very simple generalization. So in the classical case, let, let us start with classical. In the classical case, we have a set of uh, variables, I denoted by S, J, which take values from a finite set. Let's say really finite set from one, numbers from one to N. And the uh, index for, for the variables, J runs from one to L. So we imagine really cells put along the line from one to L, L is the volume, or, and actually we, we want to have periodic boundary conditions so it goes in the circle. We can say that cells are put on the circle. And then we also need a time variable. So we will have a time variable, which is a discrete variable, takes values from integers. Now, then the state of the system at a given time is just the collection of the values of the cells. And it depends on this discrete time index. And then to have dynamics, we need to define a local update rule. Actually, okay, we, we need to define an update rule. Update rule tells us how to compute the state of the system at time t plus one using the values at t. And then uh, we want to have a local update rule. This is motivated by physics, physical requirements. So something which happens locally in your system should not depend on what is very far. And uh, in the theory of several automata, there are many, many possibilities of how to you can do local update rules. Today, I will choose a specific one, which is interesting for a number of purposes, but just accept, please, that I'm just using a specific type of update rule, okay? Specific geometry for update. So how, how do we do this? Let, let me start. I, I will draw pictures. Instead of too many formulas, I will draw pictures. If it's something is not clear, then please ask me. So we, we start with the so-called fundamental update rule, which is an update rule for a collection of two cells only. It acts, so it's a function which acts on two variables, and it gives you, so we can say a pair of variables, and it gives you a new pair of variables. And when I will draw pictures, I will draw pictures like this, that it's a box, box stands for the function u, and it takes two incoming variables, a and b, and it gives you two outgoing variables, c and d. So when I draw a picture like this, then uh, horizontal direction stands for space direction, so to say, and vertical direction is for time, and time flows upward. So at the beginning, so this is earlier time and this is later time. In, in all of my pictures, I will have uh, this uh, kind of uh, geometry. Now this is an update rule which acts on a cellular automaton of only two cells, or I can say on a block of only two cells. However, I want to have an update rule which acts on a larger system so that eventually many, many cells can get coupled and will interact with each other. And for, to this purpose, we use the so-called contraction that is called Brickwork circuit. So I will explain what this picture is. It gives you a geometry of uh, several automaton for interaction of cells. So in this, in this picture, again, horizontal direction is x axis, uh, vertical direction is t axis, and time flows from down to up. If a picture is taken from a different article, it was, uh, it was convenient for me to copy PDF. I, I didn't draw this picture. Now, what you see here is here um, the variables uh, live on the lines. So e each line has a value 
which will take uh, val values from this set x, the numbers from one to n. And whenever I, I draw a box, it means that it takes two incoming variables and it gives you two outgoing variables. But now they are put in this brickwork structure, so-called brickwork structure. And in this way, actually, if you let, many, let the system evolve for a long time, then many, uh, actually arbitrary cells will couple. So what does it mean in more, more detail? So the initial values of the cells are given by the values of these lines here. This is time zero. And then at the first step, we have the action of these function u on pairs of pairs of variables, these pairs of variables. And then we obtain the system state of the system at time one. Afterwards, we again use the update rules on these pairs of spins or pairs of variables. But now the, the pairing is different because here we pair these two, these two. So for example, even odd, even odd. But here we are pairing odd, even, odd, even, et cetera. And then we go back to the original step and then again this step. So make this alternating step, alternating steps. And this in this way, actually, you can see that all variables will eventually be coupled. For example, this is coupled with this one at the first step. But already at the next step, it will be minus two and zero will be also coupled because what, what is here will de determine what is here. What is here will determine what is here. And then this will be coupled and determine what is coming here. So eventually, after a long time, everything will be coupled. And then this is what I call a cellular automaton. To be more precise, it's a block cellular automaton because at each step, I make blocks of variables and within each block, I make an update, okay? So that's just the geometry of the system. And so far, I didn't tell you anything about this U because uh, this brickwork circuit is very general. It's investigated for many types of uh, these U functions also in classical and quantum case. So, so far, there is no mention of combinatorial design. This is just the geometry of the problem, what we want to solve. And I will tell you later about the combinatorial design. However, first, let me say, tell you something, what is the goal? The goal is we want to have a solvable cellular automaton. And of course, if you want to have this, then you need to specify for you, for you, what does it mean to have solvability of cellular automaton? And I tell you a specific type of question, which is perhaps the easiest one. I want to look at, Correlation functions, correlation functions of value between values of cells. So the problem is the following that I take an initial configuration where I choose each variable completely randomly with uh, uniform uh, measures, completely randomly. And then I ask the probability of what is the prob joint probability of having at time zero at position X, the value A, and then later at time T at position Y, the value B. So this is a correlation, well-defined correlation function. Uh, and then uh, again, in physics, physics language, this is infinite temperature average because for the initial condition, we are choosing each thing uh, randomly. And maybe it's also convenient to subtract from, so look at connected correlation function or, or really the correlation. So subtract from these uh, individual mean values, but this is just one over N. So I, I should subtract here minus one over N squared and, and that's the best definition. And I say, that I, I, I call a cellular automaton solvable if at least I can compute this quantity, okay? There are many other types of quantities, multipoint correlation functions, et cetera, et cetera, you might want to compute, but for me, this is enough, okay? So if I can compute this, this is good. And I can tell you that for, for this U function, what we had, typically it's not possible to compute it, yes? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, um, yeah, 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 no, that's a good question. I, I had uh, something more concrete in mind. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I should think about the precise. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yes, yes, but uh, I need to think uh, precisely which uh, condition from what I'm telling. Uh, so yeah, 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 it, it, it will happen, but um, yes, very good question. Yeah, sorry, I was too quick, quick here. So we have, we have many requirements and one is still a physical requirement, what physicists want to have. So we should have information preserving cellular automaton, which means no loss of information. In practice, it means that this U function should be invert invertible. So if we can go upwards in time, it should be possible to come downwards in time also. No information loss. I mean, in classical cellular automaton, this is the equivalent of unitarity, basically, in some sense, in some sense. Uh, and so we want to have this also in classical and, and quantum cellular automaton setting, but this is just physical requirement. 
And now I come to the actual combinatorial design part. Because so far, what I said is just geometry, several automaton, et cetera, et cetera. And as I said, for most U functions, this quantity cannot be computed. But if we impose certain condition on this U function, it can be computed. And this will be uh, connected to the work that people in this audience are doing. So this, this property is called dual unitarity. I mean, unitarity comes from linear operators. We will get there. But for the moment, I can explain it for classical setting. So I will explain it for classical setting. I mean, in this sense, it was extracted in this work by Bertini, Kost, and Prozen, but it appeared actually many times early in the literature. I, I don't, ha don't have time to discuss everything, but for, for the several automaton, it was this paper where it appeared. And the idea is very simply the following. So I said that this function u, which makes from a, b, it gives you c and d, c and d, it should be invertible. So it should give you a bijection from pairs a, b to c, d. Now, dual unitarity. Is, is a condition where you look at this object, uh, pair, no, quartet of variables A, B, and C, and C, and D, such, and you require that it should give you a bijection also from pairs A, C to B, D. In, in alternative way, it also means that it should be, uh, you, you should be able to replace uh, exchange space and time, because I said that horizontal direction is space, this is time, but you should be able to look at this object and say that, uh, Space and time have the equal, prob uh, the same probability, no, not probability, property that this, this map will be also an invertible map when you look at this direction, the, what was original space. So, what does this mean in more, more precise ways and how does it connect to known combinatorial design? I can show you an example and then you will see easily. So, this is, a, this is an example for n equals three. And what I do here is I look at quartets A, B, C, D, I compile a table. Such that for each incoming uh, pairs, A, B, I just write down what is the outcome, C and D. The, this column will have nine uh, rows because, well, obviously we have uh, nine possibilities for pairs. And then I, I require that, okay, first of all, it should be an invertible map when I go from A, B, and C, D. So this means that in pairs A and B, each, each uh, pair is present exactly once. And also for C and D, each pair each should be present exactly once. This is clear. But now I say that this property of the object should be that also it should give you a bijection from A, C to B and D. So this means that when you look at column A and C, pair of column A and C, then in this pair of columns, again, each pair of numbers should be present only once. And the same goes for B and D. Each pair of numbers should be present exactly once. But this is the conditions that we have. And then most of you should know that now this is almost the same as orthogonal array. Because for orthogonal array of strength two, the condition is that for each pair of columns, each pair of numbers should be present exactly once. That's the definition of orthogonal array of strength two. Now, what we have here is a broken version or an incomplete version of orthogonal array. Because I told you that we should have this condition for pair A, B, C, D, A, C, and B, D. But I don't require the condition for diagonal pairs A, D, and say B. It depends on how you look at it. I, I give many reasons why it's good. So, yes. So, okay, so it's a broken orthogonal array if you want. An alternative representation of it is using uh, something like almost the Latin square. So, what I do here is I collect values of C and values of D into a square where I and B give you the row and column index. And this interpretation is from I and one less, we, we discussed about it. So it turns out that you get almost a pair of orthogonal Latin squares, except that the property is broken. So C will be uh, row Latin. You see in each row, each number is present only once. And they will be column Latin. So in the column, each number is present exactly once. And they are also orthogonal to each other. So when you look at C, they pairs, each pair is present exactly once. And then the actual orthogonal arrays or actual pair of orthogonal Latin squares are special cases for this. They have even more constraints. But our definition allows for more solutions. So that's a good thing, actually. Uh, less constraints, more solutions, and more, more types of physical behavior, which is also happening in our cellular automaton. Um, yeah, so this, this was the definition of dual unitarity, at least for this classical setting. Now let us move on. Um, as I mentioned, the orthogonal arrays uh, have more constraints, 
they give a solution for this con uh, uh, problem. And in physics language, uh, in quantum information language, they are called perfect tensors. When we go to linear algebra, I, I will go there. But it's just a name for the moment, perfect tensors. But maybe some of you have uh, heard this name. And let me also tell you the simplest non-perfect example, which might be a little bit surprising. But the simplest example for this, uh, these conditions is the so-called permutation map or swap map. When instead for a pair A, B, as an outgoing variable, I just give you B and A. And then you check that these conditions hold. So information gets propagated diagonally. And if information gets propagated diagonally, then it's very clear to see that uh, it's a good bijection also when you move from down to up. But it's also a bijection when you go from left to right. This can be understood because it's diagonal. It doesn't matter how you look at it, it's diagonal propagation of information. And this permutation map is, of course, not a perfect map. So it's not an orthogonal array. It's not. A, it's completely. It's it's the worst thing that you can have for uh, the orthogonal array definition. And that, then here you would get, get chuck, just identical columns and here identical rows actually. Okay, so let's move on. This this was the permutation map, which is one example for this. Another concrete example is this table what I showed you here. By the way, here you can also see that this is not perfect. So here, for example, when you look at columns A and D. Then you can see one and three, one and three, one and three, three times. So it's clearly not not a perfect one. Uh, but that but this you can also see here in this in this example. Okay. So what do we know then about the cellular automaton? So let's let's just go back to the cellular automaton. Let us say that we have such a dual unitary fundamental update rule, and then we build our big cellular automaton, and we want to compute something. What do we get? Now, first first comment is that if we take the permutation map as our blue box, then we get diagonal movement of conserved information. This is good to have something in mind for, for the intuition, because what, let's see what is happening. For example, if we have permutation, then information what we put here, in the first step, it gets permuted to here. But in the second step, it gets permuted to here. In the first step, it gets permuted to here. So it moves diagonally, but it's completely conserved. It moves along a light cone, if you wish, in physics language. It moves along a light cone. Left move, Left going, right going. On the other end, what, what you put, for example, here, in first step, it moves here. In the second step, it moves here. It moves here, et cetera. So it, it, it will be a right propagating light cone. So in this case, when the permutation map, we can say that the dynamics is completely trivial. There is no interaction between cells. But half of the cells will be right moving. The other half of the cells will be left moving. So that's a trivial. It's a free movement, if you wish, free movement of information. But in other cases, we will have an interacting movement of information where we can still compute these correlation functions. And then uh, what, what is the statement what we get? I will not prove it. But an important statement is uh, if you have this dual unitarity condition, then these co actually co connected correlation functions will be non-zero only if the positions combined with uh, time are on a time-like uh, separation. So this means that the distance between the two positions should be equal to the time difference, positive time difference. So this means that this correlation function is non -equal, no, 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 not equal to zero, only, for example, if you look at the value of a cell here and then values of the cell along the light cone. But it, you can choose any other cell for this particular measure of correlation function, how you compute it. It will be a zero correlation function. And along the light cones, it can be the right moving or left moving right cone. Along the light cones, it, you can show that it will be actually an exponential decay of these correlation functions with certain types of exponents, which you can compute from a finite matrix. It's, 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 at that point, it's numeric, but you only need to diagonalize a finite n square by n square matrix, so it's fine. Um, yeah. Now, the correlation function is that. Uh, so this means that you put at a certain point, you put A. And you ask a question, what is the probability to have B at another point? But you choose all, all other variables completely randomly. And then you average over this. Well, that's, that's one object that you can consider. But yeah? So, the, so this needs the dual unitarity. Yeah. 
So, so actually, I didn't write it here, but uh, that, that, that also follows from the dual unitarity very simply. Yes, that uh, along the light cone, you get exponential decay, but if you move away from the light cone, then immediately it is zero. And, and maybe just for physical, physical understanding, so if it's not a dual unitary map, then what you would get is correlation functions outside the light cone are zero because this is not affected. So for example, correlation function of this cell, and I don't know, this cell, it has to be zero because there is no time to arrive from any information here. That's the idea. But, but for if you would choose another U function, then for example, this could be correlated with this value here, right? And it's very difficult to compute it. You just have to do simulation, but no, no, no analytic formulas. And we are always interested in those models where you can get analytic formulas, and here you can get it. So that, that's the point. And I, here I should talk, give a longer introduction about what is quant chaos, quantum chaos, integrability, et cetera, et cetera. But it's important that these models are solvable models of quantum chaos or solvable models of classical chaos, if you wish. It's solvable in the sense that at least one property can be computed exactly. And that's, and that's a really remarkable thing. So it doesn't happen. In, in, in most physical systems, it doesn't happen because here it's a many body system. You have many, many constituents and it, normally you cannot solve it, okay? So that's why people are interested in all of this. It's very fashionable topic now uh, in this uh, quantum many body, uh, I don't know, condensed matter, et cetera, integrable model community. Very fashionable at the moment. Right, so, okay, this was cellular automaton in the classical case. Now let us go to quantum case. I promised you to go to quantum case. I mean, actually, this whole thing was invented for quantum case. I, I did the classical case because I got interested and I think it's simpler, et cetera, nicer, but it was started from quantum case. So in quantum mechanics, we have linear spaces, locally complex numbers to the power of N, and we have a full Hilbert space. So we have, again, sites going from one to L, length of the spin chain, if you wish, or, or a zero automaton. And then we just take tensor product of these spaces. Now, instead of this local function U, which was a function which takes two variables and it gives you two variables. In quantum case, it will be a linear operator acting on a double tensor product of C to the N. And then the circuit is the same. I mean, I can draw the same picture, but the interpretation is different. So uh, earlier it was a function, but now uh, whenever you see a blue box, it's a linear operator acting on a double tensor product, tensor product of the corresponding lines. So now, now if you wish, the individual quantum spaces live on the lines, okay? But it's important that the classical maps can be embedded into the quantum framework in the very usual way of talking about permutation matrices. So the idea is that for the original configurations, you make an identification to a certain chosen basis of C to the power N, and then you construct the linear operator as a permutation matrix for pairs. So for each pair of tensor product of basis states, you give that the end result is tensor product of basis states where C and they should be computed from the classical map. And this is a classical, this is a way to embed this classical several automata in the quantum framework simply by allowing linear combinations. You can say that you allow linear combinations and then you are there. But actually, when we go to quantum case, we have more possibilities. And this is maybe also well known to many people in the audience that if we have a combinatorial design problem in classical case, we bring it to quantum case, sometimes possibilities open up. I mean, that, that, that's uh, the, very similar to this uh, 36. Uh, uh, soldiers of Euler problem, but possibilities open up. So what, what do we have about dual unitarity? So we, we have the same definition as earlier, basically that I should be able to exchange time and space when I look at unitarity condition. So originally unitarity means that this, this object, which is now a linear operator acting from two, uh, the product, of ten, product of two spaces is unitary. So when we go from space A, B to C, D, but now it should be unitary operator also when we go from spaces AC to BD. In practice, this means that I can actually regard this ABCD as indices for our, uh, our unitary operator. And then I can make a reshuffling of indices in this particular form. And then I should require that our, my original two site operator U should be unitary and also reshuffled operator should be also unitary. And then I get a linear algebra problem. I, get, I have a conditions for elements of unitary group, which is restricting, but still less restricting, which for the perfect tensor case. So for the perfect tensor case, it's called two unitaries or perfect tensors. When we have one more reshuffling where, where you would go from A, D to B, C, here we don't have it. So we have more possibilities because we have less constraints. Now, at this point, you can ask, 
okay, we have more constraints. Now, what are solutions, right? Now, in our recent paper with my PhD student, Martin Borshi, we listed a number of constructions, known constructions for dual unitary uh, operators, or, I mean, also classical and quantum. And uh, we, now here is different because now here, here is typically you have constructions which work for any, any number of, uh, so many more ideas work, that's the idea. Um, and uh, we also gave a number of new constructions, but but simple ideas. So we didn't invent too many things. And I should say that for n equals two, so for qubits, it is there is a complete classification. I didn't write the formula here, but this is well understood. And uh, but for higher n, it's it's not known. So complete classification is not known. There are again isolated constructions for dual unitary. And of course, again any b unitary or two unitary what's that called two unitary any perfect tensor is a solution for this problem also it just has more constraints so there are some these people who are looking at these uh, yeah perfect tensors anything what they found is a solution for this problem also but but this problem is more allowing we can have much more possibilities also for construction um yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you go to a specific basis, what you like, and in this basis, you identify matrix elements of your original unitary operator, and then you just reshuffle the indices. So you define a new new matrix by just uh, changing the indices. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, and then, uh, so there are a number of constructions. I don't have time to go over all the constructions, but again, some discrete ideas which, which somehow work. But, and I can tell you now, the, this conference is called Hadamard Conference, so maybe this is a good time to tell you that there is a construction involving Hadamard matrices, actually. So the idea is that you take four Hadamard matrices, A, B, and C, and D, and then you construct your U matrix in this form. And it's very important that here, there is no summation over indices. So A, B, C, and D are, are fixed indices, no summation. And what, what does this mean? That It means that you take a Hadamard matrix for each link of neighbors. So A, B, uh, B, D, C, D, and A, C. And then uh, this particular product, where you just take a product of matrix elements of Hadamard matrices, it will give you a dual unitary matrix, actually. And this is rather easy to see, because if you go from a, a, downward to upward, then this pair and this pair gives you just phases. And then in this direction, you will have actually unitary operations. A complex Hadamard matrices, I forgot. It's even more, more wide. And when you go from left to right, then again, this, this, this uh, connection and this connection will you just give you just phases, which is a unitary operation. And then these, these and these two lines will give you an actual unitary operator, which gives you linear combinations. It's very nice. It's in a, it's in a very recent pap paper, some couple of months ago, from uh, Peter Claes and Austin Lamacraft. And I can tell you, I mean, my, my happiness was that Peter told me that they, they, they brought down this result based on uh, inspiration from our paper. Unfortunately, we didn't come up with this very simple idea, but uh, they read our paper uh, and the, the references, et cetera, and then they came up with this construction. But it's a very, very easy idea, in fact. And earlier, there were some examples in the literature with uh, basically of this form with very specific chosen Hadamard matrices. But the general idea was not, not given earlier. Okay. Any choice of four yeah, yeah. And may, maybe I didn't tell you that in, in, for physical application, maybe you would want uh, space and time reflection invariance. That's nicer. But so then, then maybe you wouldn't choose four different ones. But maybe the same, or I don't know. Maybe just two. But yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I don't know how much uh, time I do. I have. Well, what's the situation? Okay. Very. Then very quickly. I, I don't have time to go. So we, we have this paper with Martin Bosch, and we looked at the properties uh, of the cellular automaton. Because so far, I said, told you a few words about construction, but we looked at the properties, physical properties of the whole system. When, when you look at the whole cellular automaton, and we looked at, in the classical case, orbit lengths, recurrence times, and how this gets connected with conserved quantities, uh, presence of conserved quantities, presence or absence. That, but this was more like uh, experimental mathematics, so to say, it's just playing around with cellular automaton. But it's interesting because we are interested in cases when there is also extra conserved quantities in these models. But more generally, there are open questions. And one open question is, 
maybe classification or enumeration of these dual unitary matrices, both in classical case and also quantum case, and to go to generalizations for different geometries. There's also a thing called three unitary matrices, which, uh, which is a generalization. I don't have time to go into that, but that's also completely open. I don't think that classification is possible because you know very well for these types of problems, normally there is no classification, but there can be many types of different constructions and, and ideas, and this, this is not yet investigated. So um, this is an open field. So I really uh, hope that uh, people in this audience would get uh, interested in this. And then also for the resulting cellular automaton, both in classical and quantum case, there are many physical properties which are still to be computed in the general case. For example, how does entanglement gener get generated in these models? That's a very physical question. For some, for some cases, it is known, it is computed, but for other cases, it's, it's not yet known. So there are many open questions, relatively new fields, and uh, I'm really interested in any ideas or any uh, further discussions about uh, constructions of, of these uh, matrices. So yeah, thank you for the attention.